Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yahad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able and On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene is not here today. We would like to uh, thank our partner in this topic, um, Mo uh, Commissioner Monica White from the Division for, for, the Division for uh, Disabilities and Independent Living. Uh, thank you for joining us on this edition of Ableton On Air. Um, so what are the missions and goals of disabilities and independent living? Great. Well, first, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's a delight to be able to share a bit of information about my department. Um, my department is the Department for Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, also known as DALE. Mm -hmm. And our mission at DALE is to make Vermont the best state in which to grow old or to live with a disability with dignity, respect, and independence. Since you said that, how important it is, um, you know, how important is it, you know, because um, for years, people with special needs were fighting for independence through the ADA and um, different things like that. And, you know, there are still 41 states that are institutionalized for people with disabilities. But how important is independence for people with disabilities? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think certainly um, independence is fundamental for people with disabilities, for older people, for, for everyone. Um, and here in Vermont, that is really underscores everything that, that we do in the aging and disability space. Um, certainly, there have been many battles at the both national and state level to really fight for um, civil rights, human rights for people with disabilities. You mentioned the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which was really uh, pivotal legislation that was in uh, uh, over 30 years ago um, at this point that that was passed. And um, certainly, we've come a long way. Um, certainly, there's, there's still work to be done overall to ensure that folks are able to um, live with dignity, respect, and independence. Um, well Let's talk about some of the history um, of, you know, uh, when we talk about uh, independence and respect for, you know, certain words and not. Um, I remember when I first, when we first came to Vermont, certain words were, some, were on some medical applications that shouldn't have been used. They still had the word, they still had the all word, which is retarded and we should never use it. But how ha, how has respect changed and what 
do we have, what do we still have to do to gain uh, that respect? Certainly, I think um, you're, you're absolutely right. We've come a long way in terms of um, using more person-centered language. So instead of saying, um, uh, referring to someone by the disability that they might have, saying a, a person with a disability, um, instead of uh, in the older Vermonter, uh, older person space, instead of using you know elderly using um, reframing aging to older Vermonter. So it's really um, ab about the, the person being first and foremost in person-centered language is um, we have come a long way in, in that um, area. They, they don't have feeble-minded anymore. They, you're not even supposed to use the word lunatic or anything describing someone with a mental challenge, so yeah. Right, and I think you know part of that is um, historically othering people, so like those people mm -hmm. um, instead of... We, we don't want to say those people. Right, yeah. we don't want to say it because it's people, period. A person who might have a disability, a person who might be older, but that, that doesn't define who they are, and mm -hmm. I think that's um, something that so we all So let's talk about do. some of the uh, major um, the reason why, you know, to talk about the programs and how they work within Dale, for those that um, don't know, um, let's start with um, uh, the Division for the Blind and how does Dale help people with um, visual impairments and, you know, let's go from there. Sure. Um, so for our department, we have five divisions. Um, and in only one, five? Uh, only five. Uh, but those five divisions have a, a, a number of programs within each. So um, <laughs> starting with our Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired um, is our smallest division, but it's a small but mighty. Um, the Division for the Visual Blind and Visually Impaired, also known as DBVI, um, serves as, as the name would indicate, Vermonters who are blind or visually impaired through um, a, several different um, programs, one being um, vocational support, so um, working with uh, Vermonters who might be blind or visually impaired to um, determine what supports might be needed to for them to acquire employment or for their training or education, um, things like assistive Why is technology. It this why is it the smallest arm? Is there a reason for that? Um, it's just in, in terms of the, the number of staff that we have in, in that division and the number of Vermonters that that particular division serves is, is smaller in, because in scale Because Vermont has a other. small, does Vermont, so you, so does Vermont have a small amount of people who are blind and visually impaired? Is that? Um, well, I'm not sure. Uh, I would say, you know, s smaller than Vermonters who might need, um, um, uh, who might need like uh, nursing care or that sort of thing. So, um, so that's that's why it is um, it's smaller. But um, so yeah, so employment supports um, is one of the main areas that DBVI works um, works with um, independent living. So um, working with also uh, partners at the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. But well, what is the difference between the two? Um, so, the association and division. Sure. So, uh, DBVI is state government, um, and uh, you know, as part of that uh, work, works to pull to draw down funds from the federal government to um, admin to our partners who work on the ground to administer. Um, some of the programs. Mm -hmm. And so um, VABV, via the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, is a private organization, nonprofit, um, who also works in support of Vermonters who are blind and visually impaired. Um, and so in the independent living space, making sure that um, working on things like home modifications, assistive technology, that sort of thing, so people with vision loss are able to live safely at home independently. And um, DBVI also operates a business enterprise program. So um, working, uh, there are several um, cafes. One of them is the, the cafe at the Waterbury State Office Complex. I'm aware of the, yeah, that I've is, been there. Yeah, it's great. Um, and so owned and I, operated by um, people who are blind or visually impaired. And it is the one, the one, the one on, on State Street, is that operated by um, 
Um, you know, at the state house, rather, is that operated I, by people with disabilities too? Um, I, I don't believe the main state house cafeteria is. I believe there's another. I don't know the current status, but within the one of the state office buildings, I know there was, were um, discussions recently about um, bringing a one of those um, cafes online. But with the flood, and I'm honestly not sure of the status of that right now. Um, and part of that. Business Enterprise Program includes um, operating uh, vending machines at rest areas and, and that sort of thing as an opportunity for, mm -hmm. for folks who are blind or visually impaired. Um, now, let's, uh, before we get to the other programs, COVID was a big problem. I know that we live across the street and there's doctor's offices across the street from us, but how Impacted. I think I'm saying it right. How impacted was serv was services during COVID, and has it improved? Um, because for like three or four months, things were completely shut down. People. The only way when the governor spoke, he said, "You're only allowed to go to the pharmacy or supermarket, and you couldn't go anywhere else." But you know, that was a problem. Uh, and sometimes, for example, telehealth, when it comes to medical stuff, doesn't work completely. It works, but it doesn't help everyone who needs to see someone in person. So how impacted were services, and is it improved since the vaccinations and so sorry, that's yeah. a loaded question. But. Yeah, no, that's that's it's it's a it's a heavy question, but it's important. So certainly, <laughs> and I know it's probably not on that list. But <laughs> <laughs> no, that's quite all right. Um, the yeah, certainly the pandemic, the COVID nineteen, um, was extraordinarily. Uh, disruptive to everyone's everyday life um, and for the period of time where uh, much of in-person services were paused um, that really uh, was impactful to a lot of people um, and your your point about moving to, to telehealth was um, you know everyone was scrambling to um, adapt to because um, it doesn't work for everybody. Right, it, I, it, it was. That I'll give you an example. If you need, uh, I, for myself, and I don't mind, uh, since I have epilepsy, I deal with epilepsy, and it's very well controlled, I need to see my epilepsy doctor in person. I need to see <laughs> a counselor in person for some. So it doesn't work for everybody. Right. And, and I think, um, you know, part of what we were, what we learned at the beginning of the pandemic when we were, you know, thrust into um, with really n no um, advance, as advance notice to this kind of halt, everybody's remote and, and social distancing and working from home, there was, you know, a period of time where everyone's like, well, how, what do we do? And then um, over the subsequent months, realizing the, um, it, making sure that there was very clear guidance about it, it, in person uh, medical visit requirements, even, of course, you know, masked and distanced as, as appropriate, but certainly, um, you know, our emergency rooms, hospitals, health, uh, long term Crisis care facilities um, were. Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? Crisis centers. Cri yes, uh, providing services, although limited to um, urgent and. and um, the kind of the the less urgent was maybe maybe put on put on the back burner, mm. so that was um, you know for the for the first however many months of the pandemic. Um, Since you said that, that uh, um, uh, you have on your website, especially you have developmentally challenged. I like saying challenged. Do you have developmentally challenged? You have. Uh, services for people with physical challenges, okay? Do you necessarily, or does Dale necessarily, because it could match. Someone could have a mental challenge and a physical challenge at the same time, or dual diagnosis, they call it. Does Dale, per se, have services for, well, you have services for both, but when does it, uh, do you necessarily refer somebody to say Washington County Mental Health if they have, you know, or does it, or do you have specific 
uh, meshing services. You, you, you get my point there? Um, I think Am I so. saying it wrong? Uh, I'm sorry. No, that's quite all right. I think, um, so we, we, you're right. We have um, how Dale itself is structured is through five divisions. So one of them being the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, um, the other being uh, d the Developmental Disability Services Division, Adult Services Division, Division for Licensing and Protection, and the D Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, also known as Higher Ability And then the Long-Term Care Vermont. Services, too. Um, that is, actually falls under our Adult Services Division. Um, and to mm -hmm. your point about um, somebody who might need services from multiple programs, that is um, yeah, absolutely the case. Because, Can they get services from multiple programs? Um, yes. And so um, recognizing that people are not... Uh, do not always fit neatly into one particular neat box of it's oh, not, it's not one. one size fits all kind exactly of. Um, and so what we do at, at Dale is by an, uh, in large part we partner with um, a large network of community providers who actually deliver the services to mm -hmm. individuals so for example the area agencies on aging there are five of those around the state who um, deliver services for older Vermonters um, through the Older Americans Act. Um, and another example is our network of um, 15 designated and specialized services agency throughout the state who deliver developmental disability services to Vermonters. And mm -hmm. some of those agencies also do adult family care, which is through our Choices for Care program. And, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mentioned, um, I mentioned VABV. Um, I you know, mentioned what? I'm sorry. Uh, VABV, I'm sorry, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Um, there are also adult day centers. Um, there, I, I know I'm, I'm missing a number of our other um, community partners, um, home health agencies, that sort of thing, who, um, who and deliver And I notice services. also you have uh, services for people that have brain injuries also. Yes, we have a, a brain injury program that goes um, through our adult services division. So how does, how does the, so basically do you provide, does Dale provide services for um, people that I, I would say zero to five and up pretty much, right? You have child services as well? Um, primarily, the services that, that Dale um, provides are for um, adults, adult Vermonters. We do um, it for developmental disability services for um, children who have a developmental disability. We do mm -hmm. um, oversee provision of those services. So how does, how does um, so let's talk about older Vermonters and, and adults. Um, how would... Um, you know, the person gets older. You know, let's talk about the long-term services. How does that work within Vermont, for those that might not know? Sure, uh, that's a, a great question. So um, we, as I mentioned, we have um, five area agencies on aging throughout the state who have... Um, Council on Aging is one. The Central Vermont Council on Aging is, is one. Um, let's see if I can rattle them all off by memory. Uh, Central Vermont Council on Aging, serving Central Vermont. Uh, Senior Solutions, which serves the southeast part of Vermont. Uh, Southwestern Vermont Council on Aging, southwestern area. Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging. Where is Northeast Kingdom? People the, might not know where uh, that is. Uh, yes, so that is um, up. The Northeast Kingdom is. Uh, I've seen a red bus, but that is. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> so it's a beautiful area. The state is actually just there on Tuesday, up at, at the at the NEK COA, as they're known, um, on Tuesday. Uh, they're, they're, they have offices in St. Johnsbury and Newport, but um, Caledonia. Um, uh, Orleans and Essex counties, roughly, in that area of the state. And then uh, Agewell, that serves the northwestern corridor of the state. For those that, speaking about um, older Vermonters, um, I don't know if Dale deals with this, but I'm just going to. Um, if someone, because I guess the further you go up, a lot of people don't have internet connections. Does Dale help? I know during the pandemic, People were uh, scrambling and working with um, to get internet connections for those that didn't have, you know, because 
Very important to keep in touch with people. Um, does Dale deal with any funds or any programs de getting someone internet connections or mm -hmm. anything S of that nature? Um, so, in terms of um, technology, so that, technology access and the equity of access for technology is is absolutely an issue in the state. It's there's not um, everyone is not connected. Everyone does not have. Um, internet connections at home, the devices to use it, and or the, necessarily the knowledge to be able to to um, to use the internet. Um, and so, so part of the work that has been done and is in the works for that is um, during the pandemic, our AAAs, as the area agencies on aging are known as, um, had a um, initiated a program called, I believe it's called Get Set Up, which worked with um, older Vermonters cool. in particular to um, help uh, with all of those those technology pieces. So the education, the here's the device, here's how you use it, um, that sort of thing. At this other, uh, another piece of that puzzle is at the statewide level, there is, um, and it might be federal um, also, but, um, uh, either uh, rebates or lowered rates for lower income individuals to be able to access, to be able to pay their internet bill. Um, and, then, uh, and then further, there's also work being done by the Vermont Broadband Board, um, led by Christine Hallquist, to really do the full slate of the analysis over the entire state for where are the areas that need broadband, how can that be done? And Dale does have a seat at that um, at that table to advocate for making sure that the, the needs of individuals with disabilities and older Vermonters are represented mm -hmm. in that broader body of work that, mm -hmm. that is being led. Now, since you said, let's talk about more about vulnerable populations. Um, <clears throat> homeless, the homeless is a big problem. In one, I wouldn't call it a problem in Vermont, but it's, it's being worked on, okay? How does Dale, does Dale help um, the homeless population in Vermont and, and help them find housing? How, do, how would that work? Yeah, so so first I think it, it is fair to say that, that um, the housing crisis. I'm sorry if I said something wrong. No, 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 that's that's totally fine. I think it is um, entirely fair and accurate Homeless people are people too. So, Home, absolutely, yeah. um, and that the, the situation right now in Vermont with the availability of housing stock is special. So, um, during the pandemic, but then with the flooding that we had this past July, um, really, really decimated our available housing stock, which was already at, already um, already challenged, and so um, it has risen to um, a top priority for both the administration and I think the legislature to um, work to address uh, both on the. Um, making sure, uh, charting a path forward that includes more housing units, as well as prevention of homelessness initiatives. And so there's a lot of work being done on both of those fronts right now, and Dale is participating in, in all of the above because it, Doesn't it is it, I don't like saying this, and please, um, if I'm saying it wrong, correct <clears throat> me. Sometimes it can be a double-edged sword if you're challenged and you're out on the street because, number one, you have your, your challenges to deal with, you know, your medical conditions and the el elements because things can set in. You got frostbite and other stuff, and if you're homeless and challenged, it could be detrimental. So there's got to be more services besides. Um, and I know the homeless shelters in Vermont don't have don't have enough room to deal with that. So. Is there other ways that you guys are helping the homeless besides um, with the shelters? Right. So, and one of the other options, um, particularly this time of year, through the cold weather, is because um, I know the economic services, for example, mm -hmm. gives home motel vouchers. But what if um, someone yeah. is uh, so? Uh, yeah. Yep. So, so you're you're absolutely correct that the economic services division within the Department for Children and Families oversees um, oversees that um, that particular program to ensure that that. Because I know they get, I know they get what uh, um, I think it's thirty days. Or if you if you're disabled, 
or, or challenge, you probably get another month attached to it or extra time. I don't know the specifics of that program right off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> brain injuries. How um, does Dale help someone with TBI? Um, sure. So, uh, people who have um, acquired a, a brain injury through um, what, who have a, have a brain injury, we have. Um, uh, service providers to include the Brain Injury Association, uh, Brain Injury Association of Vermont um, to um, work with individuals who have had a brain injury and based on the person's needs and that sort of thing. So that's something that our, our partners do. Uh, let's talk about uh, deaf and hard of hearing for a minute. Um, I know that uh, Dale can probably help with more accommodations dealing with blunt, uh, with deafness, um, but, but what specific agencies within Dale help the deaf population, especially, let's say, if someone cannot afford a hearing aid, that must, because hearing aids are expensive. Um, example, years ago, I had gotten a hearing aid um, from Costco, and they're, they're, they're $1,800, but, Go ahead. Is yeah. there anything? Yeah. Well, first, I wear hearing aids, ah. um, and I actually I have to get another one. Myself, yeah, so. yeah. I actually just um, got my hearing aids earlier this year um, for the first time because in. Um, I believe it was the last legislative session. Uh, I'm sorry uh, if I yeah. no. That's quite that's quite all right. This is a great topic. Um, the uh, legislation was passed in Vermont um, within the past couple of years, which requires insure health insurers provide hearing aid coverage. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, I, I've needed hearing aids for a number of years, but was pretty stubborn and decided, <laughs> and also very frugal, uh, and decided I, I really could just muscle through without them, even though it was mm. a real challenge. And uh, when that legislation, which I'm personally and professionally very thrilled about, when that legislation was passed, I made an appointment with my audiologist to get my hearing aids. So um, so all of that to say that it, that legislation really um, did, have a meaningful effect on, on Vermonters who are hard of hearing, um, and which can affect folks at, at any age and adds um, significant challenges to, to daily life, as, as you know, um, mm -hmm. when, when you have and a And we shouldn't, and um, we can say as many commenters as we want at the end of this program, we should never be prideful to ask for help, exactly. especially when you're challenged. That, that, that is what we have our system set up to do when people need the help to absolutely to request that. Um, and so our, we Tell do, me more about the legislation with the hearing aids and how Dale, did Dale have any part in that? Um, I believe that that legislation was introduced before I sat, I, I joined the, um, before I became commissioner. Um, and it, ha it was several years ago. And so the specifics are lost to the sands of time in my memory. So I, I don't know that I can speak to that very eloquently. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I do think certainly that it's um, that that we have that coverage has been really enormously enormously helpful because to your point, hearing aids can be expensive, but they are important for quality of life. They're over the counter life. now, but I'm sorry. They're over the counter now, but it's uh, it, they range uh, now because the, there's a difference since you said hearing aids. There's a difference between hearing aids and then there's, you have uh, you have amplifiers also. And then you have um, other things, but they over the counter they range like three four hundred dollars. It depends what what you need, but you know it's there. Um, is that a permanent thing with the um, legislation, or is it? Um, um. I think as permanent as any legislation is. I mean, any le laws can be changed really, you know, at any point in time. But I, I don't see any future in what. I don't see anything um, mm -hmm. changing on that front. And, mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, what um, now? Uh, sign language interpretation. If somebody needs that, where did uh, where did they go for that within Dale? Um, so, um, so we do have a director of. Um, 
uh, deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind services. Her name is Laura Siegel. Um, mm -hmm. She is truly fantastic, and it actually occurs to me that it might be help. It might be interesting if you had Laura on your program to really kind of walk through the um, specifics about um, about that body of work. I think that mm -hmm. might be a great way to get what, uh, information. What what didn't out. we cover that you would like to talk about? Um, about Dale in terms of other things that we did not um, cover? Sure, so um, I think here, um, well, I guess the question, would you would you want to go through some of our other divisions work that we haven't? Yes, please. Uh, sure, mm -hmm. so one of those divisions um, I, I mentioned before is Hireability Vermont, um, formerly known as Vocally, Division yeah. of Vocational Rehabilitation. Last year we underwent a rebranding to um, something a bit more positive sounding, Hireability, um, and that division um, is based all around the state. There's a um, presence at each of the main 12 district offices through throughout the state of Vermont. and. Um, that division works uh, with um, individuals who have a have a disability, um, any any sort of disability at all, toward um, working to support that person in attaining their career goals and um, a, a career pathway, higher wage attainment. Um, Educational goals. So, mm -hmm. what does d does a person want to attain? Obtain a degree or a a trade credential, that sort of thing. Um, another big piece of hireability Vermont's work is working with youth with disabilities who are um, in high school who are going to be transitioning into adulthood, and so working with those youth proactively to identify what does high, what do they want to do after high school? What supports might they might they need to um, achieve whatever um, career or educational goals that they want um, that they want? And um, a couple of years ago, uh, one of the so Hireability offers a number of really, really fantastic programs. One of them that was that's new within the past couple of years is the Summer Career Exploration Program um, that um, work with uh, Hireability works with um, youth over the summer and employers to um, provide paid internships at local businesses and um, has been an enormously um, successful and um, great program for, for youth who, youth and employers who participate in that. So um, so that's Hireability Vermont. Um, in a nutshell, there's, they do a lot, but that's, that's a, the really high level overview. Um, our Adult Services Division, um, so I mentioned the work of um, our area agencies on aging through our state unit on aging. Um, another one of the big programs within our Adult Services Division is our Choices for Care program. Mm -hmm. And that is the Medicaid program in the state for Vermonters who are eligible for nursing home level of care. Explain a little bit about that as well. Um, I really, you know, that's important. What if someone gets older and needs more services? Um, so, and, and that is, um, so, it, the uh, um, Choices for Care program is, is designed so if somebody does meet the both um, financial eligibility for Medicaid and clinical eligibility to require a nursing home level of care, um, the Choices for Care program it's predicated, it, it's based on a choice, so um, a choice of setting. So a person could um, receive that level of care in a skilled nursing facility. Um, there are also other licensed facilities um, in the state or a person could choose to receive services at home. Um, and based on yeah, the individual's- Yeah, but if a person can't do the home, then that's why yeah. other services are there. Yep, so, so all, there's the, the range of services um, available, um, available there. Um, Let's see, I think one of the other divisions I haven't spoken about is um, Developmental Disability Services Division. Um, mm -hmm. And so DDSD, as it's known, uh, um, works to um, oversee, uh, I mentioned that we have 15 designated and specialized services agencies throughout the state mm -hmm. um, who provide uh, 
home and community-based services and supports for um, individuals with a developmental, intellectual or developmental disability um, within, their, within their communities. Um, also, people could choose to you know, hire their own um, staff to provide that service, um, either for developmental disabilities or um, choices for care. Uh, and so that, that's part of um, one, of the, one of the options. Um, and our DDSD also includes the Office of Public Guardian. Um, who oh, provides. yeah, I wanted to get to that, even though we, we haven't um, covered it. Um, what if uh, someone needs a guardian and they're challenged? Or shall I say, um, let's say someone's parents pass away and they need help um, and they're challenged and they just need some extra assistance how do, how does Dale help sure like so um, I know that's a tough sometimes morbid topic to talk about but it's it's important you know that end of life end of life planning is important for everyone at any age um, and you're right that um, guardianship can be can be part of that um, if a person is is not able to uh, make their um, if they're not able to sign contracts to understand, uh, for example, what they might be um, entering into a legal agreement for that sort of thing. Um, so, public some guardianship. People, some is, people like you know my wife and I. Some people some people don't have big families, so you know yeah. other people have to care for them. Right, and so I mean, ideally, um, if a person is in need of guardianship, ideally there is a, a family member or a friend who would be willing to step in um, into that role. Mm -hmm. um, that isn't always the case, um, and in in that case, a public guardian can be appointed, and that is done through the court. Um, and a petition needs to be filed through the court um, so because ultimately we want people to be able to, um, you know, have, uh, to serve in that role for themselves if they can. Does Dale, um, well, this is an, another topic that might be morbid, because it could happen. Um, let's say someone passes, or um, someone doesn't have a burial set up and things like that. And the person's challenged. I know that certain religious entities, like there's Hebrew free burial, and there's others, you know, if you're if you're Jewish and whatnot. But does Dale or does the state of Vermont would they give someone a burial plot if they couldn't afford it, if they're disabled? So Dale does not. That's not something um, yeah, within within uh, my department. I believe there is something at available at the state level, but I, I don't, to be candid. Sorry. No, I know that. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's. I didn't I, know if Dale, how, how Dale would help with that if someone is challenged and they don't have a, you know, and they um, get that. So is there anything else that we didn't cover? Um, I don't. Not, I, I can't think of anything um, off the top of my head. Um, the one division that I, I think I've hit all of our divisions with the exception of our division of licensing and protection, if you'd like me to yeah, share ahead. a bit of mm -hmm. info about that. And then I was going to ask you one more question, but go ahead. Oh, well, okay. Um, so I'll start with uh, the division of licensing and protection is uh, comprised of two units, one of which is adult protective services, which um, investigates reports of abuse, neglect, or that's exploitation a big topic, but of yeah. vulnerable adults. And so that, that's, that's one unit within DLP, the Division of Licensing and Protection. The other unit within DLP is Survey and Certification, who um, license and monitor um, healthcare facilities. So um, it really anything that's- And do a, background checks with people too? Uh, no. The not within DLP, um, uh, individual facilities are required to do their own, required to do background checks, for example. Mm -hmm. But um, things like uh, skilled nursing facilities, residential care homes, assisted living residences, um, hospitals, home health providers, those those sorts of are the sorts of providers that are under um, under regulation from. Um, 
survey and certification. So those are the, uh, those are the two units within DLP. Mm -hmm. What are the misconceptions around people with special needs when people first meet them? You know, uh, or sometimes people, when we're dealing with employment and people with disabilities, some people don't want to work with challenged individuals. So go ahead. Yeah. Anything you want to say no, to that? No, absolutely. I think um, there can be uh, the... I mentioned before othering, like, oh, you know, those people. Um, and That's a bad um, way of looking at it. It, it is. And, you know, I think some inherently held, um, you know, stereoty stereotypes or ass assumptions that are, that are just wrong. I think um, sometimes there can be the assumption that a person with a disability um, is not capable or competent when, in fact, that is that is not the case, and it's you know sometimes. Um, Why is it that people think that people with special needs are incompetent? Is there a reason behind that, or is it just in ignorance? Um, you know, I think it, I'm sure it varies by situation and by, and by person. Um, and you know, I don't think that there's kind of a one size fits all answer um, for that. But I think you know part of the work that. Has, has been done and continues to need to be done by all of us is, is kind of working to, to break that down. So to reflect that people who have a disability are just as important to the hearts of our communities. And than, just as capable and of just doing, as a, capable. doing a lot more than, than, than one might think. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Well, we'd like to thank you for joining me on this edition of Ableton On Air. For more information on Dale, uh, you can go to www. Uh, dot, uh, so what it, it's www.dale.vermont.gov forward slash services. So again, it's www.dale.vermont.gov forward slash services. Um, and for more information on what you've seen today and on other programs of Ableton on Air, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. That's www.orcamedia.net. Again, thank you, Commissioner Monica White, for joining us uh, on this edition of Ableton on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel on Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.